Hi, Val here, and this is my podcast, The Kalahari Diaries. I live in one of Africa's most remote wilderness areas. Nature and wildlife is my biggest passion. I hand dressed Serga the lioness and walked the Kalahari to join her on her hunts. My work is on tourism and nature conservation. For fun, but also for wildlife monitoring, I fly anything that gets me into the air. I live in an old caravan. The next supermarket is a two and a half hour drive away on sandy and bumpy roads. There is no cell reception anywhere nearby and the only comms is an extremely slow, extremely expensive satellite internet connection. I am Valentin Grüner and this is my podcast The Kalahari Diaries. All right, welcome back to the Kalahari Diaries. This is episode number 11. And first off, I'd just like to apologize for the sort of two month break that we've had again. It was not intentional. We've just had way too many things that came in between. For the next podcast, I'd like to do something a little special. And if we get enough feedback, I think I'll also try and make an effort to actually make it within a month this time again. And the next time I would like to actually just answer questions since this is an audio format it would be nice to get these questions in audio format from you anybody who is interested to to ask me in person anything about africa wildlife nature conservation Serga, our life out here yeah whatever you like feel free to ask away it would be cool to get it as an actual voice recording like a voice note that can be recorded on the phone and then emailed to us the email will be info at modisa.org which is info at and then modisa is m-o-d-i-s-a dot o-r-g but we'll also put that info on the bottom of the podcast so that you can have a look there so please uh, feel free to send in anything you like if this doesn't work out and we don't get any feedback or not enough, I have no idea how many people are actually listening to this at the moment, um, then I guess we'll just do another podcast on a different subject. But it will be nice to try and just answer questions directly. I'll try and do my best um, to do it as, as good as possible and as honest as possible. So if anybody wants to know more, any personal questions about anything, about any of the previous podcasts, anything you know about this place and our project, please just ask away freely and I'll try and answer as best as I can. But we're back now with an episode about tracking. Um, tracking in this sense, I guess, needs to be clarified. We are talking about tracking wildlife in the bush, reading nature in Africa, and not tracking our order on Amazon or anything like that. So we are really talking about a very, very ancient skill. I believe all our ancestors a long, long time ago all had to hunt to survive, not just hunt, but also just be safe out in nature. We didn't have the infrastructure, the buildings, and the security that we've built today. And... I think tracking would have been an absolutely essential skill for, for everyone, for every human being at a given point in our history. So our ancestors all had to do this. And if we're looking into some of the very old cultures today, like the sun people, the Bushmen here in the Kalahari, for example, tracking is still a big, big part of their life. And a good tracker is somebody that's sort of well recognized and is well known in the community and he knows the bush well. So it's a very ancient skill, which was absolutely essential for life. And for some communities today, it might still be that case. Yeah, how did I get into this whole thing with actually thinking about tracking? I never really had an idea of that there are people that do this sort of professionally or as a big hobby just to to enjoy actually tracking and that there's almost like a, a scientific way of going about it and learning how to how to track animals i really had absolutely no idea that that exists and i had to do a bunch of courses in south africa and the idea was actually to do my field guiding license i did a ranger course and then i had a little bit of time to bridge because at that time i was waiting for my residence permits in Botswana to be approved and I was in South Africa. So I used that time and I booked this tracking course. So initially and before having done the course, for me, the tracking course really was a bit of a thing to bridge the time. And I would have left that course out of the uh, the whole thing if, if I had had a choice 
of the three courses I had to ditch one of them. The tracking would have been the one where I said, okay, I wasn't really interested in that from the beginning, so I could leave that. And I really have to admit that out of the three courses that I did, the tracking course, which was actually short, I believe it was only 14 days, if I remember correctly, it was by far the best that I that I did. It was out of the, the field guiding course experience and out of the ranger course experience, although both of those were absolutely amazing. Somehow in the tracking course, I, I really found a, a new passion and something that just really, really got me hooked. And it's since then been something that has proven absolutely useful being in the bush and living out here this life in Africa. And I would like to try and take everybody a little bit on this journey with me of tracking and how exciting it can actually be. Because I think just thinking about it, it, it seems so boring. You're walking around looking at prints in the sand. But I'd like to get everybody just a little bit of a sort of eye-opening experience, hopefully, about what tracking actually is and how exciting it can be. All right, so first off, part of my job, obviously, especially for those who have listened to the previous podcasts, is that I have to hunt, and tracking always is part of, of that job, whether it is before the actual shot, when we're just trying to get to animals, reading the tracks while we're driving or walking in the bush that we know where the animals are, which directions did the herd go, how fresh are those tracks, and obviously after the shot to make sure that we get to this animal and should anything be wounded, then it becomes even more important to be able to track well. But that's not really at all why tracking is fascinating. It simply is something that makes us part of the bush if we're able to really experience and, and read what's going on around us. And the Kalahari is telling a story that is completely rewritten all the time. Sometimes within a few hours or minutes, if a big wind gust comes through, the sand is blown over completely. It looks, there's little, little ripples everywhere in the sand, kind of like the bottom of the ocean. If you go snorkeling and you're looking at this pattern that the waves are creating, this is what the wind is doing to a lot of our sand. And within minutes, all tracks can be blown away completely. Then some days we have completely calm days and the tracks are being left behind for a very long time. So things are becoming to go on top of each other quite a lot. It can look like a big mess, actually, and you've got to figure out which ones are the fresh ones. And sometimes it's just the night that changes all the tracks because the nocturnal insects that are coming out are leaving their mini, mini tracks on top of the tracks from a bigger antelope, for example. And that can start telling us at what time that antelope may have been there and things like that. So it's a very always changing environment and there's a story written into the sand which is readable just like a book actually and we just got to be able to learn to read the letters correctly and then it becomes so amazing without even seeing anything else it can tell us what's been going on and more specifically it can tell us what's been going on in these ecosystems while we were not observing it because I guess if we're facing reality, sitting on a game viewing vehicle or even walking through the bush with our gear on and a rifle over the back and talking and making noise and smelling of deodorants and, and all kinds of stuff, we don't really belong so much into this ecosystem. And wherever we show up, we are likely to be quite a disturbance to the wildlife. It will not behave like that if we were not around. So... By being able to read the tracks, we can actually read and see exactly what's going on without any outside interference from almost another world that comes in here. So being able to read the tracks is yeah, such a beautiful way of, of observing everything that's been going on. And often we can drive around here for days and not actually see that much. But by being able to identify what's been going on just by tracking, all of a sudden, we get this amazing picture into our head of the, this entire world and what's actually happening and something that, that might look so boring to the untrained eye all of a sudden becomes this fascinating story that we can read wherever we are, whether we're actually looking at an animal or not, makes absolutely no difference. The important part with tracking is also that it, we kind of have to understand it's not just a footprint that we follow and we're looking at the next one and the next one. It is the vegetation 
around us. It is the, for example, burnt tree stems that will indicate that many years ago there was a fire. If we can still find burnt grass bits, that's telling us about the history in a way, just by being able to identify it's the animal droppings that are left behind, the predator feces. It shows the diet that they have been eating. It can tell you a lot about the condition of the animals. The bite marks on the leaves and the branches from the antelope can show how they're eating, what they're eating, at what height they've been eating, to what height can they reach. It can indicate what kind of animal this could be. And also knowing the animal and knowing what certain species would be eating, we can tell without even looking at a footprint just by bite marks and the type of food that they've been eating, what animals that would have been. It's the smells, it's the wind, it's the weather and the temperatures, all that that is part of, of tracking anything in an ecosystem that's wild. So, yeah, that's just such an amazing thing really includes everything and to be good at tracking the better you know the ecosystem and the inhabitants and the vegetation and its history the better you can track us it's basically just about being able to id and interpret anything that is out here so it's not about a footprint it's about saying what happened to this tree what is going on here why is there a mark like this why is this leaf missing? Why is the grass looking like that? What's been happening here? And none of that has to do with a, with a footprint. It's got to do with this entire ecosystem. And even being able to ID a single animal has a lot to do with not just IDing the single footprint. Often that is not really possible to see at all. The sand here can be very, very deep, kind of like a, a sand dune behind the beach, not the nice hard sand where the waves are uh, moving back and forth on it but the soft parts behind it where i mean what next time you're on a beach just look at your own footprints in really soft sand it doesn't leave much but a mark what one could tell though for example is that whatever was walking there just had two legs a bipedal movement not four legs because that leaves it simply a different pattern you can still tell by the just where these marks are the size of that person or that animal and you can also see by the gait that it's walking in, was it walking slowly in a normal pace? Was it jogging? Was it running? All these kind of things are possible to see without any any actual print. So the print is something that we can get lucky with and a beautiful thing to show when we find one. But usually you pick a trail and then we get to a point where the surface has a better better substance to actually leave a print and and then we will get to be able to id on the print specifically what animal this was but generally it's about this entire picture and that's what makes tracking so fascinating because it really simply has to do with understanding an environment and the better we can understand that environment the better we become at tracking and I guess because I love the Kalahari so much and I love nothing more than understanding everything I can about it. That's why trekking has just been this fascinating thing that I love so much and that really got me hooked because it it really wants you to know every little detail, be it a little insect, what time of the day would this insect be out and active because then it can tell us if it walked on top of a certain track what what time was this track left here and how far ahead is this animal of me and all these kind of things so it just it's this magic story of understanding everything that happens here in the bush something that really becomes magic and i i would like to try and explain this from my first sort of experience is when we're not just looking at the surroundings and telling the story but when we're actually trailing an animal, which means instead of just looking at something and being able to say, okay, this happened here, a leopard walked last night, and here it maybe stalked a little bit, and there was some antelope probably at the same time, and then it went to drink, and we, that's that's fairly easy. That's just the ID and interpretation of the marks that are left behind in, in this ecosystem. But what is real and truthfully if one cannot really understand what's going on what seems so magical is if somebody can trail an animal with the intention of actually finding it and on a perfect trail you would find that animal without the species of that individual animal that you're tracking ever noticing that you're actually coming and i would just like to tell a little bit about about how that can can actually happen and what can happen and how it can be just a magical experience so I guess imagine somebody takes you on a trail to tr to trail a leopard. It's a dangerous animal, so there's a lot of excitement involved. And 
you, you would start an experience like this by going on an early morning drive and picking up tracks. And eventually the tracker, who usually will sit on a tiny seat right in front of the vehicle to be able to look right down onto the road and see what's been crossing. When the tracker says, no, he's found a track, and that's now should be a good one. Sometimes he'll get down and look at the track and walk 10, 20 meters, and then the tracker decides, no, no, this is too old. It'll take way too long to find this leopard. Eventually, we might get to a track where we say, this is a, a beautiful, fresh, fresh track, fresh enough to be found. And then we'll get off the vehicle. Everybody will walk single file with a tracker in front and a safety guy behind. And the people joining would be in the middle and the aim would be to be completely quiet and just follow. And the only job for the people simply joining and experiencing this would be to say, hey, we uh, we just got to be very quiet, try not to step on too many branches, try not to make much noise, do not talk and just observe and see what's going on. And then sometimes the tracker will stop and point out the prints a little bit if the tracker is aware that we're definitely not anywhere that close to the animal. He can still talk and explain in a normal voice and look at the print and detail and explain to people why this is a leopard and, and stuff like that. And then it goes on. And what's absolutely amazing is that often you have no idea how that person is even continuing to walk on the tracks because the ground changes so much. Once is deep sand and even there can be difficult if a lot of animals were walking. How does one know which of these thousands of tracks is now the leopard walking through here and then it becomes grass tall grasses where you can barely see the ground then it becomes a little bit rocky and it's very hard to see anything and then sometimes you go over a beautiful hard surface with a little bit of dust on it and all of a sudden you see there's perfect leopard prints and this is still the same track that this person is following and that alone is actually quite an amazing thing and something that seems so magical and again it really isn't looking at the one track, looking at the next track, looking at the next track and trying to follow like this, it would probably take months to get to wherever that leopard would have been that day. But it's really about just picking up a fresh trail and then being able to interpret what is this animal doing here at the moment? What time was it when it when it walked here? And by looking at the way it walks and getting this idea quickly to get into this animal's mind at that moment to say, okay, well, how does a leopard behave? What does a leopard normally do? So if you really know a leopard well, you can start seeing, no, this is now what the leopard would be doing. And and you 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 pick up these tiny signs along the way and you can look far ahead and all of a sudden, it's like you can see this little bit of a trail and you just imagine a leopard would have walked here and you, you walk that way that you imagine it would have done. And a little bit later, you'll pick up another spool, which simply tells you, okay, I'm still on the, on the right track and you continue imagining from there. And if you've imagined wrong, you go back to the last place where you actually ID the real track of the animal and you know, okay, let me imagine again. If it didn't do that, the next thing would have probably been then this and you go the next way along the next bush because you would know what would this leopard have been doing at this moment. And if somebody is not into this and doesn't understand the, the animal itself so well, it can really be overwhelming to just watch somebody walk this and be able to point out all the time and say, okay, look, here's a track. No, there's actually here a track, although nobody else can actually see along the way that there's any tracks or any, any obvious marks from that animal. So that alone... Being able to follow this trail is quite an amazing thing. And then the next thing is that eventually the tra tracker will stop and he will start telling you, now please be very, very quiet. We're getting close. And yeah, that's again, it, it's, it's a bit like, you know, are they just trying to get us excited or what's, what's going on here? Because how the hell can you possibly know that we are that close now? And then a little bit further on, he will start slowing down a lot, looking out a lot, taking the binoculars, checking the area a little bit. And eventually, if you're lucky and everything went perfectly well, the tracker will be able to point out, look over there in the tree. If you look carefully, the leopard is resting there or is lying underneath a bush or something like that. Before it's disturbed by us, and I have to say honestly that in most scenarios, those animals are aware of people arriving, but the idea is to not disturb them, not surprise them, to be aware that they are around and then just back off and leave it and not having to chase that animal because the idea of saying we can stalk up to a leopard, especially with a group of people before the leopard is aware of that, just by the fact that the hearing that they have, it's almost impossible. But 
being able to get there before the leopard will move off its spot and not disturbing it in its behavior, that's the amazing skill that's needed to really do this properly. When this happened to me the first time, and I didn't know much about tracking yet at that stage, I really thought the people are sort of joking with us and that this is kind of a setup and somebody knew the leopard is in this tree or they maybe even have baited it there with some meat. And then we walk this trail and every once in a while you just randomly find a, a leopard print and say, hey, look, we're still on this on this trail. But what then happens if you go back and the tracker can explain to you in detail why did we find this leopard and how did he know what's going on? And there's things that are so simple and so amazing that it's nothing magic at all. It's just magic that somebody can actually do this and do it properly. Explaining it is one thing, but being able to carry this out in the bush is a completely different thing. But if we go back along this track and he says, let's start again from the beginning. And he starts pointing out and says, look, this leopard was just walking, walking, walking. He's taking a little bit of cover here, of cover there, always on this certain side, which means there were some animals most likely over there. By the way, the leopard will place its feet. You can see if it was standing looking to the left, for example. If the leopard is doing that a lot, looking left, he's probably going to stay to the right of certain bushes because he's focusing on something that's going on on the left, which could have been animals, could have been something he doesn't like. But in any case, he's taking cover. And that means he's going to walk on that side of the bushes all the time. And if we can identify by the track that this was nighttime when the leopards are usually active, that means the leopard wouldn't use any sun spots or shade spots, uh, therefore, on sides of the bushes, and he had a different purpose. Yeah, so as you go along a little bit further on this trail, you will see that the actual spoor prints or the footprints of the leopard are now much less covered by little nocturnal insect tracks than they were before, especially in the summer months. And all of a sudden you start seeing that it's so much clearer now. And the idea is that the, the water tells you simply that those tracks happened basically with sunrise or just after sunrise when a lot of these nocturnal moths and, and some certain termites and stuff like that, when all that stops moving and you'll start getting other insect tr tracks, but it's not never that much. It's now one, uh, thing that will maybe walk across some animals that are diurnal insects that are crossing the leopard but but the print itself becomes much more clear and it's actually something if you take pictures from the beginning and then you show it just there half an hour later you can see oh so this was early morning just before sunrise and then just after and especially in summer in Africa as the sun comes up it gets hot it's already warm at night and the moment the sun starts hitting anything it's it's brutally warm and Immediately, you can see when someone points it out, now instead of looking somewhere and using a certain uh, area to walk and maybe being aware of a herd of animals on, on another side or something like that, all of a sudden that leopard track will go every time along the side of the bush where at that time in the morning the shade would have been. Which means now we know exactly it was sunrise, it was early in the morning, if it's now 10 o'clock while we're tracking or even lunchtime, we know, okay, that leopard is only that much ahead of us, but also because leopards are nocturnal animals, they avoid the heat. This means he started feeling the heat. He's using the shade of each bush that he walks past to stay cool. And that's the point where you start looking out carefully and looking for resting spots. The, the more you know your area and the way the animals behave in that area, you'll know very quickly where to look and w which places to be able to say, okay, there it is, or there it's, it's not here, and you walk a little bit further, you follow his tracks, but you'll you'll get to the spot, but you start being very, very careful not to disturb that animal. And after having it pointed out like that, it's just amazing that this thing that first, it's almost something you couldn't believe. You say, no way. It's it's just incredible. They had, somebody was standing here telling the guy in a little, you know, he probably had a little knob in his ear. And if you try to imagine how did they do that, we always think technology. And and actually, when you go back without any technology, it's really just reading these tracks. And it's so obvious. There is nothing there is nothing magic about it. It's, it's proof after somebody tells you how this really works. And the amazing thing is that it's not really so much about the footprint at all. It is about how does a leopard behave? What would it do at a certain time? And how do I interpret this? How do I know what time it was when the track happened here? And depending on that behavior, you know very, very well that the leopard 
is still far ahead, so you don't have to worry too much. Or we start slowing down, resting a little bit more, lying down. You'll see those prints, obviously, and especially if it was lying in the shade, that means it was getting really warm. And that's how you can find the leopard without disturbing it and read that whole trail out. And yeah, if having people follow that have never done it before, it's this magical experience. But I think what's what's just such a beautiful eye opener is to just go back afterwards and say, okay, now let's explain why did this happen? Why did we turn here? Why why did that happen? Why did the leopard do this? And all of a sudden, it becomes a, a clear picture, and that's sort of learning to to read the, the bush a little bit. Okay, so just a few examples about the actual ID of the animal because usually when people start getting a bit of an interest in tracking, then it will start off with just wanting to be able to look at the, the prints and just be able to identify what is this. And roughly that can just be done by looking at the, the general thing. What what are we looking at here? And we basically have what's cloven-hoofed animals, which is the two little hoof pieces in each foot we're looking at the same on a on a cow or a goat or a sheep even a pig and then we have animals with just one hoof which would be like our horses and stuff like that and then we have animals that have a, a padded foot which obviously is our predators then our mustelids and badgers and stuff like that um humans have padded feet then we have a couple of odd looking padded feet with fingernails and stuff like that here in Africa. Uh, those are usually not too hard because we don't have that many, but we have funny things like elephants, hippos, and rhinos. Those have very, very special feet. But if we just stick with the more simple things, we have the predator-type padded feet, like a cat, a cat's footprint. Then we have the different antelopes, and all our antelope are cloven-hoofed animals, which means they have those two hoofs in each of their track and sort of a, an elongated shape that, that normally narrows down towards the front a little, a little bit. And those, ho those two hoofs move a bit independently from each other. They can spread out a little if the substrate is more soft and stuff like that. And then we have our one animal here by us, which, which only has the one hoof, and that's our zebra. And on top of that, all the different predators. Now, with the predators, we have the cat prints. Then we have our dog-like prints. And the dog-likes are the jackals and the hyenas and stuff like that. Now, there's one big difference between these animals, and that is that on all the dog-like animals, the claws are out all the time, which usually on a wherever we have nice substrate where we can really see the, the track properly, you will be able to see the claw marks very, very clearly. Then on our animals like hyenas, for example, they have a very odd way of walking and turn their feet outwards quite a bit, which is quite easily recognizable. And also the entire shape of the foot is not at all symmetrical. So if you try and divide, and even if you can't see the print properly, but you, it just doesn't make sense, you can't draw a line through it. There's not two equal sides. Whereas a cat print is much more round, much more symmetrical. And also usually much less turned outwards. Although a big old male lion, a lazy old guy, also would turn it, especially its front feet, quite a bit out. But then again, I don't think anybody that has a little bit of experience here could re uh, confuse a lion print with anything else, especially if it's a big male lion. They're just absolutely massive. When we're starting to look at this IDing these tracks, it's simply just to say, okay, what direction are we going we're looking is it a hoof yes it's usually it'll be a cloven hoofed here then then it get, can get quite difficult with the different antelope now often it's looking at the behavior a little bit too where did it walk what did it do by looking at the gait and the distance from where it places the feet and where it places the same foot the next time if this was a normal walk we can actually fairly well judge its size because that distance will pretty much be its shoulder height the animal is roughly like a, if we exclude any tail or, or neck and head story, it's pretty much a, almost a square box from the front leg up to the shoulder, then back and back down on the, on the other leg. There are exceptions, especially the hyenas, specifically the brown hyena, which has a funny back that arches down a lot. But on most of the antelope, it's actually almost a square box. And that foot, wherever it places that again in a normal walk, that will actually be exactly that distance from that spine distance, which means we now get the height and, and stuff like that. So we can quickly 
just by looking at even if those prints, if we just know, okay, it's some sort of hoof, but we can't see anything else. Now we can say, okay, hang on, it has that height. Because, for example, a kudu, which is an animal, an antelope, that's adapted to living in, in the bush only, and it, it eats of leaves. It's what we call a browser. So it doesn't graze, it's eating leaves, which means it always around very, very tricky areas because the ground is full of dry leaves and, and branches, so it makes a lot of noise. So a big, big hoof would be very yeah, damaging for its existence because it would make noise all the time. So despite the kudu's big size, they actually have fairly, fairly small feet. So by looking at this track, it, it could look like a like a baby eland or something like that, for example. But if we would be looking just a little more closely, we would very quickly see, hang on, the, an eland that small, when the feet would still be as small as a kudu, we could see by the, the spacing of the track. So it's much smaller than a kudu would be. But by seeing, oh, that's a, a big spacing and a small hoof, we now know that's probably a kudu track. Now, if we want to know, is it a male or a female kudu, even without seeing the print very clearly, we'll be able to quickly see what gender this animal is by looking at the difference between the front and the hind foot. Now, the same counts for most of our cat species, like the, the lions, leopards, cheetahs, and so on, although cheetah are a little bit of an exception. But if you imagine a, a lion, it's a beautiful big animal. Now, imagine a male lion with the big mane and the big head and this big chest, and then a fairly tiny waist, actually probably even tinier than some of the ladies because uh, the ladies have to give birth and are designed completely different. So a lioness is a beautiful, slender lion, also very massive in size, but in comparison, her front and compared to the back is very much the same and the whole body is designed to carry weight in the middle during the pregnancy. So the lion, the male lion is designed to fight and to defend. And that's why he needs that big chest and the big mane. So he can't get bitten so much around its, its neck. And they have therefore much, much larger front feet in comparison to the hind feet. Whereas a female would have, although the front feet are slightly more, more large, because obviously she still has a big head, also a lioness and a neck to carry, but it's much, the difference is much less than it would be on a male lion. So just by looking at that, we can see quite a lot on the gender. The same counts for a kudu, especially a kudu, where you have the male kudus with a very massive neck, which then supports the head that carries these huge, huge horns. And then we have a female, which is a beautiful antelope, but it's got a tiny neck and a head with no horns at all. And again, the body needs to carry weight much more in the center where, where she'll be pregnant. So that's why the feet would be much more similarly in size with the female and much larger on the front foot with the male. So we can, we can see quite a lot from a spore in the sand, which might not even be a clear print yet at all. Then we can start following this and we can go much more into detail. If we now get to a place on hard soil with a little bit of nice dust on top and we have some perfectly preserved prints or even some sort of clay type muddy thing where the animal may have left some nice prints, although that gets slippery and funny often, so it's not actually that great. But if we if we get to this place with perfect, it's just hard soil with nice dust on top, a thin layer of dust, and then you get these perfect imprints. Now you'll be able to see we may have known from before that this is a kudu. We may have known it's a kudu bull because of the, the we can see the size difference a little bit on the on these tracks, even though they weren't very clear. But we can't tell much else about the kudu yet. But once we get now to a couple of these places with the clear dust and hard soil, we'll be able to see see nicely the actual hoof. We can see now how many pieces of it are broken how and what kind of shape is this hoof how does it look like is it growing too long or has it got many cracks and stuff like that which can now start telling us something about the age of this kudu and if we really think this is a very very old kudu then we'll go a bit further and we'll find places where he's been eating and we'll look at the bite marks on the trees but then we'll also look at the droppings which they will be leaving all over the place and just by looking at how well did it digest its food that would have been a bit of an indication of how much could it chew, how good are the teeth, we can then start seeing the condition of the animal in general, we'll be able to see what has it been eating and how does it move and all these kind of things. So it, it starts giving you a picture about this kudu, which 
you may never know, even if you're standing right next to taking photographs, because the feet are in the ground, you'll never be able to have a look on the bottom of his hooves, but you will be able to do that by, by being able just to follow it a little bit. So that's just where, yeah, you can, you can tell so much just by looking at the actual prints just over maybe a hundred meters and identifying and interpreting this correctly. Then with our cats, the big giveaway is three lobes in their main pad that prints into the sand where a dog like animal doesn't really have that. And the overall round shape, and then we, we have quite a lot of cats here. Cheetah are very different where the, the claws are only semi-retractable, basically not retractable, actually. It's much more like a dog foot, although they do have the three pads. And compared to other cats, their entire foot, specifically the hind foot, is slightly elongated, not just roundish. And also on a cheetah, the hind foot's very large in comparison to, to its front feet and specifically in comparison to the picture of a track from any other cat. So by looking at where it's placing its hind foot um, and how big that is, we can see that's a cheetah in, in comparison to the front foot very, very quickly. And the reason for that is because a cheetah is really designed for speed. It needs its back legs and those muscles to run and therefore the feet are quite a bit bigger. There are so many more things that I could be talking about, but I don't really want to bore everybody with more of the, the, the little the little bits and pieces about tracking. But I, I hope I can get people a little bit of an idea that it, it's such an amazing thing to do just to track. And the knowledge it takes about an ecosystem to be able to interpret these tracks properly is incredible. And therefore, if if we go into communities in Africa... And you find people who really know how to track, who who can really find that leopard and show you. Even if we can barely communicate with these guys, the skill that they have and the knowledge that it must take about this ecosystem that they live in is so incredible. And it is so important that we preserve this, that, that somehow this is being kept alive because... I mean, that, that is knowledge about nature that we are still trying to identify and to put into our books. But there are people here who have a knowledge and a skill about this ecosystem that's absolutely incredible. If we're looking at it from a simply practical point of view, tracking, if you're living out here, is very, very useful. We've mentioned in the beginning, obviously, the hunting part, tracking is something that, that makes hunting a lot easier and is simply essential in order to hunt successfully and to hunt well and properly out here and at the same time for myself with Serga on all these walks Serga just runs off chasing animals and so many times sometimes for hours all I do is walk on her tracks if I hadn't learned to do that at least a little bit before I started it I could have lost Serga quite easily in the beginning because she never had a collar on and she usually would always come back but sometimes that may have taken a hell of a long time and she maybe would have not heard me calling her because it could go so long because she she's just so excited about the animals and for me it's it becomes so easy now after nine years of walking on Serga's tracks it's just what I do when once Serga leaves I go I just slowly walk on the tracks because I don't want to run after some kudu for example Serga can do that, and if she catches it, that's fine. If she just wants to run and jog after these tracks for some time, then she can do that, and I just follow her. So that helps me a lot while I'm outside with Serga. But much more importantly, tracking is an amazing tool for conservation efforts, for wildlife serving, for animal counting. There are methods to scientific, properly developed methods to use track counts to interpret that for a larger area and estimate the total numbers of wild animals. And also what's so important is that compared to aerial counts, where we will pick up the larger herds, herbivores, we barely pick up any predators from the air because during the day specifically all of them are lying under a bush in the shade on a branch in a tree. There's no way that we're going to pick that up while we're flying. And then there are so many nocturnal animals and we're looking at things like pangolin, which is highly endangered and one of the most trafficked animals in the world. We have animals like the aardvark and so many others that would never be part of any wildlife survey if it's just being flown. So to me, the combination of both is extremely important. Although the tracking survey gives you both the nocturnal things and all these small animals and the predators, it also gives you the herbivores and the bigger herds of animals that we would spot from the air. But it's just nice to get a comparison on many things to see how correct was the one survey versus the other. And 
an aerial survey can give quite uh, many, many advantages just simply by the area that can be covered quite easily and quickly. But both have such value and is so incredibly important. Another thing is anti-poaching work, being able to identify tracks properly by, by, by looking at what's going on uh, on the boundaries of o- our area already inside if we know somebody came in illegally. Because people can climb a fence and jump a little bit and wipe off their track. you got to be able to interpret these things very, very quickly. And then again, if an incident happened and we need to go and you know, solve this crime and catch the people. Having good trackers that will know how to find these guys before they get out of the bush is extremely important because once somebody who say, for instance, killed a rhino and runs over with the horn, once they hit a tar road or a river on a a boat, it's basically becoming impossible to find them again. But if you can catch them while they're inside one of these large areas in the bush where these animals are, a, a good tracker with the right intentions is really something that is so important to have. It's also this ancient skill set and I believe the few communities left that still practice this and have these skills are becoming increasingly rare. So trying to give them a way to use those skills is something that's so important and not only to preserve the skill itself but also to preserve that way of life for those people. And there's a pretty amazing organization which actually is the one that I initially did my tracking course with and I actually obtained a tracking ID and interpretation level three from cyber trackers in South Africa, which is a person called Louis Liebenberg who started the whole thing together with a bunch of other amazing people. I remember Adrian Lowe was the instructor. They've written a a bunch of very cool books. If anybody's more interested in this, they also have a nice online presence. If you look up cyber tracker, you're going to find enough out about it. And I think we're going to put a link to it on the bottom somewhere on of the podcast so people can look it up. They're trying to establish an evaluation system so that people with no formal skills, such as speaking English, reading, writing, math, anything like that, but that they can still be examined in their tracking skills and that they can be issued with a certificate that shows the level of expertise that they have in tracking and that that could then be something that they can take to go to a reserve or or ranch private ranches wherever there's areas where tracking may be needed and they can say look i can't do much else in in this modern world but i have a skill here and it's proven that i have that and it's proven with our modern world so that it gives them something to make them employable which is a pretty amazing initiative and hopefully this can still go a long way. I believe tracking and conservation is so far very underrated and needs to be used quite a lot more. So for everything else, uh, by the looks of things, we are hoping to open up our new camp here in the Kalahari sometime next year in the first quarter of the next year. If things go well, it all depends on the pandemic and the COVID-19 situation, which has shut us down now for, for quite some time. But hopefully we'll be open again soon and people will be able to come and enjoy the Kalahari and learn quite a bit about the trekking, going on bushwalks and learning about all the little signs and bits and pieces out here in nature is going to be one of the the big and extensive activities that will be carried out all the time. It's eco-friendly, it's fun, it's beautiful, we're part of nature and I hope that it'll be open for anybody who wants to actually come out and experience this in real life very, very soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Kalahari Diaries. Did you enjoy the podcast? Fantastic. You can help me tremendously by subscribing and rating it on your podcast app. Leave a review and tell friends and family about it if you feel like it. If you want to know more about this story, go ahead and check out the website on sergeythelioness.com or follow me on social media. You'll find me on Instagram and Facebook at Val Grüne, that is at V-A-L-G-R-U-E-N-E-R, and at Modisa Wildlife Project, where I'm sharing photos and videos from the Kalahari on a regular basis. I'm Val, and you've been listening to the Kalahari Diaries.